So, uh, welcome, welcome to everybody to, for, to this uh, World Economic Forum session on Japan. It's, uh, uh, if I may say so, a particularly well-timed session because uh, Prime Minister Abe has just won another term in office uh, towards the end of last year, which will make him, uh, if he completes his term, uh, one of the longest-serving prime ministers, if not the longest-serving in post-war Japanese history. So really a historic figure and somebody who obviously still feels that he's got a lot to do, both on the domestic front and on the international front. And I hope over the next hour we're going to explore what Abe's Japan um, is going to be all about in the coming year. Uh, just a little bit of logistical stuff. You'll find that you've got these uh, headsets. I think English is on one and, and Japanese is on two if you need translation. Um, let me just introduce our, our panelists uh, from the United States. Uh, we have the Honorable Jane Harmon, uh, Director, President, Chief Executive Officer of the Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have Mr. Nobuyuku Hirano, uh, the President, Group Chief Executive of Mitsubishi. Oh. We have Mr. Takaheko Nakao, who is the President of the Asian Development Bank in Manila. So for these purposes, an international figure as much as a, a Japanese one. Uh, representing the government, if I can put it that way, we have the Honorable Kentaro Sonora, Special Advisor to the Prime Minister, Member of the Cabinet of Japan, and thank you for coming over from Tokyo. I know it's a very busy political time in Japan. And then we've got uh, Dr. Heizo Takanaka, once a government minister, now a Professor Emeritus at Keio University, and Member of the Board of Trustees at the World Economic Forum. And Professor Takanaka, perhaps I'll start with you. Uh, as I mentioned, Abe's got a fresh start, but he's already been in office for, for, for a while. What do you expect his priorities to be in the, in the next term in office, and what do you think they should be? Well, thank you very much uh, for a nice introduction, and it's my great pleasure here. Well, uh, I remember uh, 10 years ago, we had a Lehman crisis. And at that time, we became all uh, deep blue, and we were forced to forced to smile on the stage. <laughs> but we are smiling now, spontaneously. It is indicating Japanese economy is basically really good. While we are in the so-called uh, great moderation, global economy is good. And also, owing to the effort of Abe's uh, government, Abe no mix, the Japanese economy distinctly changed. It is important to accelerate the uh, speed of the change. That's uh, what that is required for the government, I think. For example, stock price became almost three times since the inauguration of Prime Minister Abe. And uh, yes, uh, uh, market capitalization is now reaching 700 trillion yen. Mm -hmm. This is 20% higher than the, its peak at the time of the bubble economy. And also, uh, well, very interestingly, the, uh, reflecting the demography, the working age population decreased by 5%. However, number of workers actually in the market, working in the market, increased by 3%. This is indicating the rate of unemployment substantially declined. This is all the outcome of the Abe government. But still, we uh, need more to do. For example, how to uh, realize the fiscal consolidation. This is another important topic. And also, yes, assuming and uh, uh, accepting that Abe is quite doing well, and the Japanese economy distinctly changed. Based upon that, I would like to raise two points. One is, well, still, for example, in the world ranking of competitiveness, Japanese situation is not so much improved. Still, we need more effort. And also, in the case of the university ranking, ranking Tokyo University ranking is declining still, uh, so we need more effort. And in this regard, one worry is a kind of uh, complacency. Well, business people and government people are very optimistic. I'm also optimistic, but I should not be too optimistic on that. In Japan, we use a call Ichikyo, one strong, one strong, many weeks. Well, in the diet, LDP is very strong. Opposition party is weak. Inside the ruling party, Abe is very strong. It has no rivals. Under such circumstances, there is a, 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 a risk we became in something, something like complacency. Uh, so we need more effort to, uh, to promote the reform. And the second point, this is a final point, is, well, uh, as you mentioned, Abe government will become the longest lasting administration in the history of Japan politics. I really welcome that. 
political stability is very good for the economic development. At the same time, we should now ask what will be the legacy of Abenomics? Well, as I mentioned, they're doing well. Economy is recovering. However, for example, as for long-lasting government, Nakasone government, they privatized the Japan National Railway. They, they privatized Japan Telephone tel uh, Telegram. And uh, uh, Koizumi government, they terminated the post-bubble era by disporting the non-perfing law in the banking sector, and they privatized the Japan Post. So in that sense, what will be the legacy of Abenomics? Well, if they succeed in uh, the constitutional amendment, this will be the legacy. If completely they completely uh, stopped the deflation, this will be the legacy. In that sense, still, we, they are on the way. Uh, but anyway, uh, the government is doing well. It is very important for us to recognize first their effort. Then uh, we expect them to uh, accelerate the speed of the uh, reform. OK, well, you, you raise a couple of important issues which we'll return to later in the discussion. Sure. The constitutional reform, I think, is both really important and interesting and slightly mysterious sometimes to outsiders. So I'd like to discuss why that's, that's okay. so important and also the... Um, the whole question of Arbonomics and has it achieved its goals, does it have further to run? But I'd like to turn now to, to industry, Mr. Hirano. I mean, we heard an optimistic take that things are going well, markets are up, industry is confident. You uh, run what, one of the companies. Are we still allowed to refer to Japan Inc., but, you know, one of the, <laughs> the industrial titans of Japan? So how does it feel from your seat? Well, in fact, uh, you know, every, every new year, we have a New Year party to host the, uh, the clients. And when I address the, uh, the big audience uh, upon the podium, I clearly sense the difference between this year and the previous year. Mm -hmm. When last year, the people were a bit fearful about what's going on in the political scene in the world, Donald Trump's USA and uh, Chinese reform and uh, Brexit, Europe, what will happen? But now the people, I mean CEOs on the floor, really regain their confidence and they are ready to make the further investment, uh, both in domestic and globally. Uh, they are still very much keen in uh, pursuing the acquisition in order to expand their business globally. So the mood among CEOs in Japan is much better than in the past several years time but uh, having said that, I think the, uh, you know, there are uh, the many issues. So we should not be too much complacent. That's my point. Um, for example, uh, you know, the uh, Japanese uh, inflation rates, it's set as target of 2% by Governor Kuroda when he inaugurated into office, but it's not there. And also, uh, wage increase is still weak. Of course, there is a kind of the, uh, the magic there. While everyone working uh, in the, uh, the industry gains more than the previous year, but the average income doesn't grow as much because of the, uh, the way of the participation of the laborers. I mean, more women's participation into the, the workforce and more senior person's participation will push the average you know, income of each individual lower. So how to improve the, uh, that kind of aspect? That's another important point. Uh, and also, um, you know, we have the, the real long-term challenge in terms of the sustainability of this uh, recovery of the economy because of the uh, aging population further continuing declining population. The population is not just aging, it's shrinking now, isn't it? Shrinking and aging, yeah. right? <laughs> so it's a kind of double penalty uh, yeah. imposed on us. So I, I think the, uh, the Japan uh, is a kind of advanced economy in terms of the uh, a lots of problems. So we need to address uh, those issues in order to make uh, our economic you know, recovery more sustainable and deliver the real wellness to the, uh, the society, the working people. So I think the, uh, there are a couple of issues we need to further uh, focus on. One of them is the uh, society 5.0. I mean, you know, we need not to be pessimistic 
Explain or, to people who might not know that, what, yeah, well, how, yeah. would, how would you summarize Society 5.0? <laughs> Society 5.0 is different from Industry 4.0. <laughs> industry 4.0 focus on the manufacturing industry or value chain of the supply. Right. On the contrary, Society 5.0 put more focus on the social welfare through Industrial 4.0 and advanced technologies. So Japan is very good at the uh, old robotics or IoT uh, or uh, you know, big data and so on. So we should you know, deploy all those Japanese competitive edges to improve the quality of the life and well wellness of the society. That's how we would like to pursue and address the, uh, the problems we are facing right now. And you know, further encouragement of the women and senior people to the workplace is another point. And the third point is education. Now, our administration is focusing on how to you know, grow the people uh, to be better qualified to do more creative job. And that's another challenge. So higher education and uh, you know, vocational training and also reskilling you know, the, uh, if you fully apply information technology, then you will substantially reduce the current sort of the, uh, you know, administrative job, uh, operational job, routine works. For example, at our bank, we will reduce probably 30% of workforce in coming 10 years. Wow, 30% cut. Yeah, that's right. We have to reskill those people you know, who is capable enough to do new job, you know, being engaged in the, uh, the higher, you know, technical skills or a more creative way of thinking. So that's another point. And but just, just briefly, to but beyond the company, I mean, you say you're going to shed 30%, and presumably you're not going to be alone in that in Japan. So what are these people going to do? Well, but that's another good news. I mean, different from other parts of the world, as I, you know, said yeah. at the beginning, the, the population is shrinking. Right. So robotics or AI, so unemployment's you know, not IoT, enemy. all those are the friends rather than enemy or the, the, the party threatening our life in right. the future. But the point is how to reskill and change the mindset of those existing people to new challenging job. Okay. So that's something the government needs to be very mindful together with the industries ourselves. Okay. Yep. So Jane uh, Harmon, can I turn to you for an external view? Um, the Japanese, Japan is like my own country, one of those countries that thinks it has a special relationship with the United States. And I think it's very true in the case of Japan. And yet, uh, arguably, on his very first day in office, Donald Trump delivered a big kick in the teeth to Japan by pulling the US out of the TPP. Nonetheless, he seems to have built uh, a, a close relationship with Shinzo Abe. So how do you see U.S.-Japan relations in the Trump era? Well, first of all, I think I would fit in well in Japan since I am shrinking and aging. <laughs> <laughs> think about that. Uh, but I am a recovering politician, as you know, uh, yeah. Gideon. I spent nine <clears throat> terms in our Congress before fleeing the partisanship to uh, head a, a really wonderful nonpartisan uh, uh, think tank uh, dedicated to the memory of uh, President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, at any rate, uh, I think that Prime Minister Abe has been uh, very clever. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, dumping TPP, I personally think, was a mistake. And uh, Japan and a few other countries have led uh, the, the, the effort to form TPP-11 uh, when... Uh, uh, Justin Trudeau was here a couple days ago. He announced proudly that Canada's joining, and I think that TPP-11 uh, will uh, be very successful, and U U.S. leadership will sadly be diminished because we're not in it. Uh, but at any rate, P Prime Minister Abe moved swiftly after that to engage uh, President Trump, and the golf outing, the, the, the gold golf club <laughs> was brilliant. Uh, I'm sure I don't mean to diminish the fact that the conversation probably was, too. This golf uh, club was gold? It was gold. It was a gold... <laughs> gold colour, I hope, not solid. I, I have no idea, but it was a <laughs> golf driver, you know, with the big head that was yeah. gold. I mean, yeah. that was a good, good choice of gift for this president. Right. So I'm just saying. I, 
And uh, uh, the meetings have gone well. I mean, Trump was also in Japan. And I think, it, you know, on a short list of world leaders that, that President Trump truly likes, uh, Prime Minister Abe might be at the top. I'm, I'm looking at his government. Yes, I think that might be true. And I think that's very helpful to Japan and helpful to the U.S. Um, I, there are very tough issues in the region, um, no question. I think the economy is the good news story. And exports are surging, of course, then watch out for Wilbur Ross, who's going to say trade deficit, trade deficit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think the Trump administration's definition of trade deficit is, is exactly right. I think it, I, was, I, was, I got a tutorial here yesterday that it's more based on investments and savings than it is on this zero-sum game of who owes That's who dumb, money. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, I think the economy is surging. That's a good thing. But India is surging in the region. That's a question mark. China has risen. That's another question mark. North Korea uh, still has a, uh, an arsenal of missiles and nuclear weapons. It hasn't mastered the reentry cycle yet, but it is uh, obviously worrying to the region that North Korea is surging ahead. And hopefully, um, this pause for the Olympics will lead to uh, serious conversation and uh, certainly, the experts at the Wilson Center think a freeze for freeze is is the best outcome that we could could expect now. Okay, well, we'll, we'll come back to Korea in a, in a second. But uh, Mr. Nakao, as I said, in a way, you're an outsider. You work at the ADB in in Manila. Um, how do you think Japan? Well, if we were having this conversation 20 years ago, we would have assumed that the Asian economy was Japan was kind of the, at the center of it. Now I think people increasingly think, well, maybe China's at the center of it. So what future is there for Japan in an Asian economic system in which China is looming larger and larger? Yes, it's very true that uh, uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, Japan was uh, the uh, top of uh, flying geese model, and uh, other countries are following Japan in many ways, including uh, how to develop. But today, of course, it's more networks. Some countries have a more advantage in some sectors. Some uh, countries have a, uh, some uh, competitive edge in some sectors, like Korea, China, India, and so on. So, but uh, uh, and so in that regard, Japan's presence is uh, now lower. We should accept it. And uh, even ten years ago, uh, uh, China size of GDP was smaller, or half of Japan. But today, it is two times, uh, two point five times as much. And uh, the US is three times instead of two times. So we should accept it. But at the same time, if we look at the uh, uh, productivity or the growth rate, uh, working population per capita GDP is growing uh, higher pace than the, uh, that of the United States, like 1.6% uh, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the US 1%. So Japanese people's working population working hard, and uh, they are growing. But at the same time, because of uh, yen's uh, rate and also the uh, nominal uh, growth uh, is smaller because of deflation, our presence is, I mean, Japan's presence, by the way, I'm not uh, uh, representing Japan. I'm an uh, uh, international yeah, organization, yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. I shouldn't say we, but uh, <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we are doing, uh, uh, Japanese are relatively doing better. And if we look uh, to uh, uh, the uh, some infrastructure, like in Yokama, we had an annual meeting last year. There were people that are so impressed by the beauty of infrastructure, the coherence of the society, and the safety of the society. So yeah. Japan still has a very many things which are attractive uh, Asian uh, countries, and I have a Philippine friend, Chinese friend, Hong Kong friend, they really like, uh, love to go to Japan, and regular visitors, like twice or three times a uh, year. So Japan has so many things which are attractive Asian countries. So the question is uh, uh, whether uh, Japan can continue to uh, have a productivity gains, more innovative and interesting, and uh, also the uh, presence in the world econ economy can be higher by our efforts. But uh, uh, it's, in a sense, too pessimistic that we lost, uh, Japanese lost uh, two, uh, 25 years of uh, decades totally. Uh, some things are better, although we have uh, challenges like aging, shrinking population, <laughs> and uh, poor families like a single mother. We should uh, look at those things. But as a whole, uh, society still keeps uh, coherence compared to other countries. And I would like to mention some measure to do, but uh, after. Uh, OK, yeah. we'll come back to it. Yeah, because Mr. Sonora, we should, we should hear from you now. Thanks, as I say, for coming over from Tokyo. Give us a sense of how you, from within the cabinet, 
see the task ahead for, for the new government. And I think people would be particularly interested to understand this argument about constitutional reform. What, what would uh, the Prime Minister like to do and why is, why is it important? If I may, I should like to speak in Japanese, so please wear the uh, headset. Currently, on a global basis, we are uh, exploring the bird eye diplomacy, and uh, especially we place emphasis on free and open in the in the Pacific uh, initiative from uh, Asia through in India to Africa, that would uh, contain more than half of the global population, and the management here uh, should should uh, be considered as a global public goods and uh, make it a good triggering point for a uh, growth in the current um, uh, century. I think there are three points in this uh, initiative. One is uh, the uh, rule of law, that is the freedom of navigation. And the second is that uh, the uh, countries around should um, uh, strengthen the, the solidarity or activities uh, to enjoy economic prosperity. And the third uh, is the capacity building to enforce uh, the law of the sea because there are pirates and some such um, illegal actions. And uh, probably uh, the point I should like to refer to here would be economic connectivity and uh, strengthening it. There are three points to it. And the people ask uh, if we uh, will be building ports and harbors, roads, or railways. Well, that may be one aspect, but it's not all. The second important point is the capacity building, human resources building, and what sort of infrastructure to support it. The third would be the institutions and systems building in various countries, like customs and customs clearance system. That is to say, the improvement of overall infrastructure as well as human resources development, as well as institutional improvement. We are trying to tackle these three aspects concurrently. And in order to um, enforce that, uh, there should be cooperative efforts to um, have the transparency so uh, and also the openness, open to everyone, and economic um, uh, good results. And also, there should be fiscal sustainability so that the um, two burdensome a, um, a lending would not add to the burden on the borrowing side. And uh, that would mean uh, the money from the private sector, government sector, as well as international financial institutions such as ADB uh, under the leadership of uh, President Nakao. It's not that we alone can make a good result. Uh, last year, we had a director general's uh, uh, discussion starting between four countries, US, uh, Australia, India, and Japan, so that Indo-Pacific region could be the center of growth where Japan can join in. So, Abe government is uh, pursuing this, and this idea we had from back in 2007, but uh, we are emphasizing uh, this again in terms of relationship from, with outside. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's very interesting, interesting to hear you talk about the Indo-Pacific, which is this phrase mm. that uh, Donald Trump is also using. Um, what you didn't mention much in your remarks, but I felt there was in the background, is, is China. And how much of Japanese foreign and economic policy is now driven by um, a need to respond to the remarkable growth in China. And to focus the question, do you see yourself now as in economic and strategic competition with China, or is there still room for a cooperative relationship between China and Japan within the Indo-Pacific? Mm. Um, 
uh, EPA. Mm -hmm. uh, this covers 30% of the total GDP of the world. So in that sense, uh, we are now well uh, balancing the trade balance. Abe himself has a very uh, explicit uh, philosophy on this. Japan should be a proactive contributor to the world peace. This is one thing. And the second one is uh, Japan should be the uh, promoter of the multilateralism. And uh, in that sense, well, so it is very important to watch China in this regard. But China's GDP in terms of, uh, in that denominated the term, it's a 2.5 times of that of Japan. In that sense, we cannot ignore the China. One serious problem for us is uh, relating to the fourth industrial revolution. Yesterday, uh, Chancellor Merkel raised this point that the state capitalism, under state capitalism, they are gathering big data. And this is a, a, every competitiveness is based upon the big data from here on. In that sense, how to cope with uh, this kind of uh, the, uh, cope of the state capitalism? In this regard, inside the other government, we are discussing very seriously how to establish a big data uh, in Japan. And the government of Japan this year, uh, uh, sorry, last year, established the, the a kind of controlling tower, the committee, to gather, to gather the uh, big data. Uh, asking the private sector and the public sector uh, both. And also, uh, the government is going to uh, establish the so-called so -called, uh, the regulatory sandbox, regulatory sandbox to promote the uh, business startup, to promote the accelerate uh, the regulation. So uh, combining this effort, the Japanese are, uh, well, uh, watching very carefully China, and considering the nature of state capitalism, uh, Japan is also uh, promoting the reform, domestic reform, uh, economic reform. That's the important point. Okay, mm -hmm. President Nakao, I mean, in, in a sense, you, um, you're at the heart of this odd, partly cooperative, partly competitive relationship, because, of course, everybody was wondering about what is the continuing role of the ADB now that the Chinese have set up the AIIB in, in, in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Do you talk to the AIIB, and uh, how do you see the, t the two roles of the, the, the organization? About the AIB itself, uh, I have had already more than 10 times of discussion with the President Jin, uh, because he was a vice uh, president of Asian Development Bank before, uh, or during the time of Mr. Koda. But we have a very similar uh, kind of backgrounds from Ministry of Finance International side, and we know finance, and we know developing countries. So we share very good uh, kind of uh, discussions with uh, him, and we are co-financing already four projects, and we are doing more. And they are trying to follow international standards about procurements and environmental and social impacts and so on. So we are co-financing, we are cooperating. And about China itself, uh, uh, China uh, became a member of uh, Asian Development Bank in 1986, but we still kept the uh, Hong Kong, uh, China, and uh, Taipei, China as a different membership. So ADB is, in a sense, a very good uh, uh, system to engage all these countries and uh, will continue lending to China for climate change, uh, which is renewable, water, and uh, urban uh, poors, and so on. Those are uh, uh, very appreciated by the Chinese government. So I have a regular meeting with the Minister of Finance of China, and we share discussions about the bubble or not, and Japanese experiences over dealing with the United States pressures and uh, other issues, and how we can support China. So that kind of element should be there, although there are different views between China and Japan still. But it is also true that we have learned a lot from Chinese uh, cultivations and civilizations, and also they learned a lot from uh, major restoration, post-war, uh, the and also after Cultural Revolution, Japan supported Chinese development a lot, and uh, Japan was the most, the biggest export orientation to China at that moment, and uh, a lot of ODA finance for ports and uh, uh, airports and so on. So. We have had a, such a good relationship, and we should promote this idea, although there are differences, and we should ask uh, uh, China to uh, uh, stick, uh, adhere to uh, intellectual property rights and other rules. We should have a rules more about these things, but we should cooperate. There is no op uh, other option, uh, at least in the economic uh, arena. Yeah. Well, one simple question to Mr. Nago. May I? May I? Yeah, please. Well, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, year 2008, 2009, you have a research institute in Tokyo, right? Uh, ADB Research Institute. Oh, yeah. ADB Research Institute uh, submitted a very interesting uh, proposal uh, to establish the fund for infrastructure. The demand for infrastructure is very strong. 
so uh, US and Japan should establish a new fund. However, both government ignored, ignored what kind of discussion was done at that time. And during that time, China established AIIB. That's my recognition. I'm sorry, this is a very stupid question to but, you. But uh, we uh, established a new fund in the ASEAN uh, several years ago. But uh, ADB itself is now becoming larger because of uh, more capital, because of income, and so on. So we will continue to play an important role to fill the infrastructure gap uh, in Asia. But we can cooperate with the AIB. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I already with you know, two gentlemen said, and uh, China is the, uh, the most important market for Japanese industry. But, and also, uh, you know, Mr. Xi Jinping made clear he will be the global leader of free trade and globalism upon the uh, Davos conference last year. Yeah. But on the contrary to what he uh, proposes, there are the many uh, problems uh, in addition to what you commented, IPO. intellectual property issues, but also free flow of the data or uh, uh, disclosure of source code or uh, obligation of putting the server on site. You know, those uh, restrictions, constraints over the data uh, will become the very big obstacle for global companies to run the business, in, not only in China, but also globally. And on the top of that, the, uh, the, another issue is state-owned enterprise. In addition to overcapacity issue, which China government is very, very seriously you know, addressing. I appreciate that initiative, and some visible you know, outcome has been observed in the past several years. But still, in the uh, uh, Made in China 2025, yeah. they kind of made clear they will continue to support the uh, state of state-owned government initiative to acquire the company in order to get the uh, high technology and advanced, you know, the, uh, the industries, um, you know, intellectual properties. So those, you know, the initiatives, perhaps described as market distortional policy and actions, that should be in question. And we, together with perhaps other, you know, the uh, US and European countries, needs to let them think about those policies will be uh, the really serious impediments for them to become that real leader of the global economy. Okay. I will now uh, t um, let the audience do some of the work and uh, ask them for, for questions. Um, I think, do we have microphones around? Yeah, over here. So if you want to stick your hand up, if anybody who has a particular question to any member of the panel, I'm conscious there are also people behind me. So if, uh, <laughs> um, we're all being very uh, cautious. So, um, I, <laughs> and, and if there are no questions from the audience, I'm, I've got plenty of my own. Um, so, I'm, I'm happy to continue. Uh, Mr. Sonora, I mean, one of the things that's been um, quite striking about this particular Davos is you have had leader after leader uh, stand up Macron, Merkel, uh, Narendra Modi all saying, I'm against protectionism, I'm in favor of free trade and the global system as it is. Um, and it seems by implication they're criticizing Donald Trump. I'm sure that, uh, that Japan is also, as you said, very much in favor of the, the liberal, open, rules-based order. How much do you think that order is actually under threat? あの、おっしゃるように
して少し見解が違うのかもしれませんけれども日米の中でいわゆる公正な国際ルールを我々は守っていかなければならないという共通の認識は僕は今でもあると思います。To be a, so almost a contradiction or a tension, if you want to be fairer, uh, at the heart of Trump's approach to Japan, because Japan's a crucial security partner in the Pacific,、yeah. but equally it's, as Trump would say, bad on trade.、Mm-hmm. Do, do you think he's ever going to resolve that contradiction, or they're just gonna, it's just going to be there in, in the I don't think he minds contradictions.、Yeah. I don't think he thinks that way. He thinks in a transactional way, he thinks about trade agreements in a transactional way.、Um, uh, I think the relationship has to be managed very carefully by Japan, and Japan is doing that. And I think Japan is successful because Prime Minister Abe has、uh, the golden touch here. He really has figured this out. And I, I uh, uh, so, more so than many other leaders. I just wanted to say one thing about what Mr. Hirano said about China. I agree with him, and I think the Trump administration is right to focus on. Intellectual property theft and、uh, other challenges,、um, you know, the, the forcing of companies, yes, to, to abide by Chinese rules if they want to do technology in China.、Uh, and I also think we haven't mentioned the cyber issues, and they surely relate to defense, but the cyber capacity of China and、mm. North Korea. Uh, and possibly their ability to proliferate it to non state actors is a big threat for the whole world, but certainly in Asia, because China's in Asia. Okay. The, the lady over there had a question. Thank you. Um, um, I have a question about、uh, South Korea because、uh, you know, China is very, very important for Japan's relations、uh, and also a、uh, big player in Asia. But also,、um, right now, we have a quite shaky relationship with South Korea, Japan South Korean relationship over historical issues. So,、um, I think、uh, South Korea can play a very, very big role in tackling the issues with North Korea. So, I wonder、uh, what you have,、uh, what kind of prospect do you have for China?、Uh, no, I'm sorry, South, China, South Korea and Japan relationship. I think that's one for you, Mr. Sonori. Yeah. I don't know. 隣国であることは間違いないし民主主義国家という意味では北朝鮮の問題をこうマネージするにはどうしてもこの日米韓というものが我々の基本的なアライアンス,アライアンスというか協力関係じゃなければならないこの立場は変わらない一方でその例の慰安婦合意これ最終的かつ不可,逆不可逆的に解決すると合意をしたはずなのに政権が変わったらまた違うことを言い出してるお互いの国の国民の間にあの不信感みたいなものがどんどんどんどん高まってくるとです、ね、民主主義国家の政権というのは非常にやりづらいしたがって我々はこのもう一度国際約束を守ってくれということを言い続けてそれを守ってもらうということをまずやることによってもう一回こう安定した関係としてどうやって取り戻すかというのは今年大きな課題になってくる決してその枠組みから韓国を排除しようという意図もありませんむしろこっちが日米韓というのは我々基軸だと思ってますのでそこは今年もきちっとやっていきたいと思います。So, I have a question regarding Japan's competitiveness.、Uh, Mr.、Uh, Takenaka mentioned about the declining、uh, Tokyo University rankings, and Mr. Hirano mentioned about retooling the workforce, which is, which is a problem that most other companies have. But do you think,、um, what do you think we need to address? How do we need to address the issues about education? Because it's been going on forever, and the number of、uh, people studying abroad is decreasing. I think that's an issue, but I don't see any policies in place to actually accelerate the process.、Um, so, what do you think needs to happen, and 
what are the what is the government doing or what is the private sector doing about it? Well, thank you very much for raising a very controversial question. As for Tokyo University, I have been proposing to privatize Tokyo University. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, in the government, I privatized Japan Post. The, the, the CEO of Japan Post is uh, sitting here today. Uh, but anyway, I say, or well, even in the case of the United States, the federal government is spending a lot of money for science and technology. However, Harvard is a private university, Princeton is a private university, and uh, Cambridge, Oxford, all private university. So now the government is providing some grant to Tokyo University and uh, Kyoto University, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So very sound competitive environment is not realized. So uh, this is a little bit of exaggeration, I understand, but this kind of uh, method is needed to be employed as for the university. And uh, higher education is very important. As for the company, well, in the case of Japan, business startup ratio is low, half of that of the United States. At the same time, business closing ratio is also <coughs> half of that of the United States. So the metabolism of the industry is quite low. In order to strengthen that, the two policies are actually being taken by the government. One is to strengthen the corporate governance. Corporate governance code was uh, approved by Tokyo Exchange three years ago. And now, many companies, 96% uh, of the listed companies are employing uh, independent outside board members. This is one issue. But still, we should strengthen more. Another one is the fundamental labor market. This is the current uh, challenge of the government. This is very difficult. Uh, but anyway, uh, in this uh, current session, the bill of the, the amendment of the uh, labor standard law will be uh, put and deliberated. Mm -hmm. This is the first time in the 70-year history of the, this basic law. So in that sense, uh, I expect the challenge of the government. Yes, uh, when we are talking about uh, the Japanese presence or profile in world economy, what we should do is, of course, uh, in addition to the diplomacy, in addition to other works, uh, what is most important is to keep, to make uh, Japan interesting, vibrant, and attractive uh, economy. And to do that, what kind of things can we do? And first is that we should take in the kind of uh, very strong growth uh, based on the demand of consumers and the investment in ASEAN. ASEAN is growing very much, and uh, it's more market-oriented. India is doing so, and China is also growing. So we should take in this dynamism of uh, economies of these countries more seriously than before, and uh, uh, that is one thing. And so we should invest more. And when I visited Hong Kong two weeks ago, the very senior official said that Japan doesn't invest as much as it is needed, because there are many opportunities. But uh, because of uh, kind of a fears from uh, the uh, CRS financial crisis before, uh, it, companies have been very timid. But there are many chances in Japan. If we look at the right. chances of uh, uh, the uh, demand from Asia, and the second point is maybe you should pay more attention to value added. That is, we should sell the uh, good things uh, in a more uh, pricey way instead of just uh, making it cheaper. So uh, that kind of mindset, how we can market, how we can brand our products, the Japanese products, and how we can based on the very perfectionistic craftsmanship, which many people uh, love. How, how can, uh, can we make money about it? And then we need to invest more in the uh, R&D, and also we should make companies more innovative. And so there are many chances within the companies. Oh, SM, SME, small and medium-sized companies are there. But also, even in big uh, uh, manufacturing companies, there are so many seeds of uh, new ideas. And then we should unleash those things in some way or another through the corporate governance. And first, we should have a more diversity. We are now hiring more people from uh, students, uh, 150 students from abroad in Japan now. They want to work in Japan, and we are hiring more. But we should have a diversity from the perspective of talent and women's and also uh, many other things. And we should make uh, work-life balance better. Without happy life, we cannot be innovative. Okay. Uh, and finally, we need to raise uh, the revenue raising capacity of government to support poor people, to secure the public uh, education, to secure the uh, uh, kind of uh, support for uh, the uh, R&D, and also redistributions of income is important. So we should make the public sector also strong. OK. Uh, was there a question over here? Uh, more near. I'm a global shaper from Tokyo. Um, um, 
After I arrived in Davos, what made me even more proud of being Japanese is that everyone loves Japan, Japanese culture and Japan um, uh, itself as a country. But my question is why we are so pessimistic? And <laughs> um, uh, I was wondering if it's our natural characteristic or because of our situation. And if so, how we can change our mindset and um, or we can just stay as it is. Uh, Vivian, can I say something? Yeah, please. First, I want to point out that every question has been asked by a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so things inside, are looking up. Inside, right? Things yes, are looking up. <laughs> and it is certainly true that getting more women into the workforce in Tokyo is something the Abe government is addressing. That's also good. Uh, Japanese products <coughs> are very popular in the U.S., uh, the auto industry is huge, Japanese auto industry in the U.S., and U.S. workers are hired to produce <coughs> Japanese cars and other Japanese products. So uh, just as an American woman, I'm very optimistic about Japan. It's these men sitting around who are <laughs> pessimistic. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think as far as I can see as an outsider, a lot of what uh, connects what Prime Minister Abe is trying to do is actually precisely to restore a sense of optimism, dynamism, uh, and to, 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 to combat any sense of decline in the nation, say, on the contrary, Japan can, can go forward. And that's perhaps an uh, appropriate uh, theme to, to end. We've got about 10 minutes to go. I mean, looking forward, you could paint, I'm afraid, kind of a gloomy perspective for Japan, because you could say, if I, if I were to make the gloomy case, I would say, OK, you know, it, it is a much admired country. It has a, a wonderful sort of culture, envied lifestyle. As you said, tourists love going there, but it is aging, it is shrinking, <laughs> and it has a, uh, it's unwilling really to tolerate immigration to boost the population. And it has an, a slightly scary neighbor in the form of China with their big historical grievances against Japan, which have not been resolved in the minds of the Chinese. On the contrary, if you look at, say, Chinese television, there's a lot of anger towards Japan. And so, although I think there are lots of um, positives, undoubtedly, for Japan, you, you can make a case for, for being concerned about the future. So um, I'd like to ask you all to end by, by trying to make the optimistic case, if you can, and to say, in 20 years' time, if Abenomics works and if Abe's reorientation of Japan works, what, what will Japan's domestic and, and international situation look like? What, what's the goal? Mr. Sonora? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> で、今までは日本政府はどっちかというと少子化対策をやりましょうって言って、要は、そのことで、あの、決闘機なんかで、あの、世界で初めて超高齢化と。で、乗り越えた結果、世界で初めて超高齢化と。で、乗り越えた結果、世界で初めて超高齢化と。で、乗り越えた結果、世界で初めて超高齢化と。で、乗り越えた結果、世界で初
those you know, very solidly installed mindset among the uh, 100 million population isn't so easy. But if I analyze into why it, it is the case, I think that's the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the people uh, became less confident about the future. So then why? There are many uh, structural issues or structural impediments we need to address, such as the social security issues. You know, the, the reason why people do not want to spend, despite the fact the, uh, the wage increase at the, uh, the household is as high as 2%, which is higher than Japan's you know, GDP growth rate right now. Why? Because they feel their future is not secured. So I think the social security uh, reform uh, is the, uh, one of the critical uh, policy the Abe administration, Abe administration needs to pursue. And on, on the top of that, another point is fiscal consolidation. Of course, at this point of time, uh, you know, Japanese, you know, the uh, sovereign debt exceeding 200% of Japanese GDP is sustainable, actually. Because you know, the more than 90% of Japanese sovereign debt is held in the hands of Japanese investors, mm. including institutional investors, individuals, and by us. Mm. So we would not change our minds overnight. So at this point of time, it's safe. But over 10 years, 20 years, is that really sustainable? That's the very deeply rooted question in every people's mind. So we have to address the uh, you know, fiscal consolidation issue. Sure. So from the bankers' viewpoint, perhaps those two, in addition to what the, uh, uh, everyone has commented already, uh, is the uh, fundamental challenge and the, uh, the, the political you know, the, uh, initiatives of the administration with the uh, overwhelming support uh, from the uh, voters in Japan and assure the uh, probably another four years' term should Made the, uh, make the, uh, the utmost effort over other, any, you know, the uh, political agenda. Okay, so we've got three minutes left, which gives a minute to each of you. Just, to, <laughs> so, just an impression, but what's your sense? Are you optimistic about Japan in 20 years' time? Oh, yes, I'm optimistic, of course. Uh, but in my impression, uh, senior people are relatively optimistic. Younger generations are relatively pessimistic, I'm afraid that. The, uh, 20 years ago, Paul Krugman wrote a very interesting book, Diminished Expectation. When expectations are high, well, with a lot of complaints. Well, we have a high expect expectation still because we have a lot of resources. Japanese culture is nice, Japanese uh, environment technology is nice, uh, etc. So we have a lot of discussions. See, this is because we believe that we have a high potential. Uh, compared with this high potential, what has been done is still limited. Okay. This, this is what exactly what uh, we are discussing. So I'm uh, always optimistic, and that this will be uh, this potential will be realized. I believe. Jane, I mean, l looking at Japan from from Washington must be very interesting over the last 20, 30 years because thirty years ago Japan was the country that was going to take the world over, much in the way right. people talk about China now. How do you see the future of Japan now? Well, I've already. Uh, proclaimed myself as an optimist, and if there are 17-year-old Japanese women who uh, are, are very uh, in, involved already in Jap Japan's future, how could we lose? Uh, I, I think that Japan is viewed by the Trump administration and by uh, those in America, both in the business side and the political side, as a as a, a very valued ally and someone we want to stay close to. We didn't discuss changing the, the Constitution and what will happen uh, if Japan uh, separates itself a bit and develops its own, at least, defense, defensive defense capability more than it has. That will be a, a big change. I think that will happen. I think that's going to happen in Europe, too. Uh, as at least the Trump administration proclaims America first, uh, other parts of the world are taking that seriously and, and, and focusing inward. I, I'm not sure that's a bad thing. I think that uh, the global order must be sustained, but can it be uh, modernized and, 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 and reconsidered to some extent, extent in a multipolar world, which we now have? The answer is yes. And Japan is one of the important powers in this multipower world.
Yeah, present account. Yeah, there are many reasons to worry about the future, but there are several reasons that we can be optimistic. One is that, again, the Asian countries are growing, and there is a very strong demand for the attractive uh, Japanese product, including tourism. And uh, as when we, we were more industrial power, people didn't pay so much attention to these details. But it is really craftsmanship, which uh, many Asian countries love. So there is a chance there. And also, behavior of uh, young people are changing, and women are changing. And I think uh, young uh, people are more adventurous, and uh, they have more startups compared to the previous uh, time. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, women are more active and make uh, things more interesting. And also, uh, <laughs> I would say, they have a very strong views uh, to connect to the Asia, for instance. Uh, they don't uh, uh, regard America as superior than Asia anymore, and it is part of Asia. So there are many. And also, uh, there are changes for the behavior of men. And more, many young uh, officials of uh, Ministry of Finance now uh, uh, cook and uh, send the kids to the <laughs> national school. But when I, when I was 45 years old, I already cooked every meal for my family because uh, my, <laughs> wife was, uh, my wife was a uh, writer in the uh, paper. So, you put, you put uh, the same, yeah. So <laughs> if I boast this, my uh, wife is always scolding me. It's, uh, like you are doing the things which should, be, <laughs> which should be done instead of just boasting as if I'm exceptional. But yeah. young people's <laughs> behaviors are changing. So there are changes to the Japanese society. Yeah, there are cautious optimism, maybe. Uh, they held, I think. Yeah, yes. no, absolutely. Then you, you were obviously at the forefront of social change in Japan, so congratulations <laughs> on that. Um, no, well, well, I'd like to, we've, we've come to the end of our, our, our time, but uh, it's been a, a great discussion, full of uh, interesting insights and I think interesting questions which we'll see unfold over the coming years and I'm sure we'll have opportunities to discuss at other Davos meetings. But for now, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all of you on the panel and thanks to the audience for... for the <laughs>